Great. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. It's just a delight to be with you. I'm uh, here bright and early in California, six o'clock, and uh, it's an honor to be able to share some uh, ideas, some thoughts, some inspiration uh, during these critical times that we're in. And I'm going to be focusing really on food as medicine and getting even beyond medicine. Actually, I think um, that's the, the underlying idea that we have within ourselves, all the keys that we need to live a happy life, a healthy life, fulfilling and purposeful life, and make a positive contribution to our planet and to uh, the, really what needs to happen here to help in the awakening of humanity. So I'd like to um, just start maybe um, with just taking a moment, uh, just perhaps turning our attention within just for a moment and give thanks for uh, this precious opportunity that we have to be together and for this technology that helps us to connect across the miles and across the time and space in many different ways and to connect with the consciousness that is within us that yearns for liberation for joy and freedom and for discovery and for making the most fulfilling contribution that we can in this adventure that we're on uh, of a human life. And so we give thanks for all the people in our lives who are helping to raise awareness, who are contributing to making a healthier and more kind and loving and just uh, and compassionate world. Uh, we give thanks to all of the teachers in our lives, to all the teachings of all the traditions that help to turn our minds away from the delusion of separateness to the truth of the infinite interconnectedness of all life. And we give thanks also for the communities that we are in, the, this beautiful planet Earth, this abundant celebration of life here. And we give thanks for all of our loved ones, for the whole human family, the whole web of life, and for our connection with the source of life, abiding here on this earth as a bridge between heaven and earth. And this very, in many ways, temporary and transient, brief time that we have on this earth that we may use every moment to full advantage for the benefit of all living beings. May all beings be happy, may all beings be free, and may we realize the original brightness of our mind. And may we continue to work together to build a more enlightened society that cares for everyone, for all living beings. We give thanks knowing this is so. So it is. So. Uh, yes, thank you all again for joining us. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and um, do a short video. I wasn't going to do this, but then I just had the idea. It might be, it might be just kind of interesting. Not really a video, just uh, some some pictures. So I'll go ahead and um, and do that now, and uh, just take a moment, and uh, we'll just switch over here. I know the the drill, so uh, we'll do that. And um, uh, here we go. And so uh, let's see. So um, I'd like to um, um, begin and um, let's see here. Yeah. Okay. So as we heard, I'm the author of this book, The World Peace Diet. And uh, the whole idea with the World Peace Diet, as those of you who have not read it, is to give the big picture of the consequences of animal agriculture. And the underlying idea is that food is really important uh, in, in the, uh, not only the health of uh, us as a human being, but the health of our society and the health of our planet. And so I'm going to be talking about that somewhat. I'm also going to be going beyond that and talking about the five elements uh, about air and water, earth, fire or sun and ether or spiritual dimension. 
Uh, but we will be talking about food and, and of course we'll have time for your questions at the end. Uh, so this is going to be a lot of information uh, in a very broad way. Um, but, but the world peace diet is based on the basic idea that all of us as human beings have been given this gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to celebrate our lives here. So that's the basic good news. And that pervades everything that the basic fact that the very complicated problems that we have on this earth can be solved in an embarrassingly simple way, as the founder of permaculture said, I think it's really true, by looking at our food, by looking at our relationship with the earth and with each other and getting back uh, in many ways to a more fundamental connection uh, with nature and with our food and with our consciousness. <clears throat> so that's what we'll be talking about here. Uh, so of course the, and then I'll finally just say the, the problem of course, is that we're born into a culture from the time we're little kids where everyone around us are, they're very well-meaning, but they want to make sure we get plenty of protein <laughs> and calcium. So we're compelled from infancy to eat the f flesh and secretions of animals who have been abused and that the toxicity of that and the violence and the uh, disconnectedness, uh, reduces not only our physical health damages the environmental health and cultural health, but also reduces our, our intelligence. Uh, and I can go into that a little bit, but basically uh, there's a huge amount of information here that I would love to share. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move right in. So basically this is me. <laughs> I think I'm about whatever, one year old here. I was born in 1953 in Concord, Massachusetts. And my father was a piano player. So there I was, I was the oldest child and wanted to uh, do the same thing. And I'm so glad <laughs> that he played the piano and loved it. He would come home from work and play the piano. And I uh, saw how much he enjoyed it. And he was my first piano teacher and, uh, and he played uh, jazz and blues and standards from the thirties and forties, fifties. And um, I learned some of that, but mainly I was classically trained I, I, and, uh, and then rock and roll. And then I started composing my own music in college. So I basically play my own music that I compose myself now for the last uh, 50 years or so. And um, that's, uh, that's that. And then this is my wonderful spouse, Madeline, uh, about the same time she was born a few years before me in Switzerland. And that's her. And so we've been uh, married now about 30 years. And uh, our mission uh, together is to help bring the, the vegan message to the world. Um, I was, like I said, I was born and raised in Concord, Massachusetts, uh, in 1953. So I'm just about 69 years old at the moment, apparently. Um, I learned to swim in Walden Pond and I'm very inspired. I, I didn't realize at the time, I guess it was when I went away to college that I began to see the wisdom in uh, Thoreau's teachings and Emerson and Alcott, the, the conquered philosophers, the transcendentalists um, who emphasize the importance of connection, uh, an authentic connection with nature uh, and with inner silence and with the spiritual traditions of the world with uh, Christianity and with Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, uh, that these the great sages and saints of the world had attained a higher level of consciousness and that this is really uh, the purpose of life actually is the purpose of life is not to accumulate things or to impress people, but to awaken uh, to what is referred to in some cases as cosmic consciousness or uh, our true nature. And to through that uh, be able to be a healer uh, and, and to be able to be uh, someone who can help awaken others to uh, the deeper levels, but we can't give what we don't have. So I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to find only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn that what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. This is really important. And I think the great tragedy of many human lives is that we never actually live. And I really decided at a young age, I wasn't gonna let that happen. Uh, so right after college, uh, I, when I was in college, I went through kind of a crisis of meaning. I was going to take over my father's newspaper business. And then I decided that I would be sucked into a world of, of business where I would, <laughs> I would emerge maybe when I was 60 and 
um, never really have time to meditate or to understand my true nature. So my brother, Ed, that's Ed on the right there, and myself, who was two years younger than me, we decided to leave home right after I graduated from college in 1975. And so we walked, we were going to walk to California. This is us uh, in, in Concord, Massachusetts, or actually Maynard. Um, uh, we, we were inspired by Ramana Maharshi, some books we were reading, who said, just find out who you are. Ask the question, who am I? So we walked with no money um, all the way to Buffalo. It took a couple of months uh, to get there. And then we headed south and walked to Alabama, again, with no money. With It was quite a, an amazing adventure. I could talk a long time about that. But we ended up at the farm in Tennessee uh, a few, uh, eventually, at the end of the year. And uh, we, they were all vegetarian, so we became vegetarian. They were actually vegans. Uh, we learned about the, the devastating impact of animal agriculture on human health, uh, especially starvation. They taught us about the fact that uh, they were eating lower on the food chain so there would be enough for everyone to eat. So that's when we, I became a vegetarian in 1975, uh, when I was, I guess, about 22. And then um, a few years later, I did become a vegan in California about 1980. And uh, so um, this is us on our journey. I ended up when I got out to San Francisco in 19, whenever it was, 77. Eventually, I, I was living in a meditation centers in Alabama, and a Zen center in Alabama, and then in uh, another Zen center in Atlanta, Georgia. And then I decided to drive out to California in the late 70s, and I moved right immediately into a Tibetan Buddhist meditation center, Kagyu Droden Krinshab, uh, in the Mission District of San Francisco. And I was just a, a kid, really, in my 20s. Um, but I jumped right into that. I did a lot of Tibetan Buddhist meditation practices, long retreats. I helped translate a book from Tibetan into English. I did the, the main work on that and uh, presented it to the Dalai Lama. In this photograph, I remember uh, he gave us the Bodhisattva vow. And uh, so I had, I really was honored and blessed to study with a lot of great lamas uh, in my 20s. And uh, then eventually got into Zen. Uh, again, I became a Zen Buddhist monk uh, in 1984. Um, I, right at, I, was, I got my master's degree actually at San Francisco State in Zen arts focusing on Zen arts. And uh, I was very interested always in, uh, in Asian culture and uh, spent so much time as the only white person <laughs> in the room. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, Tibetans or a lot of Koreans or whatever it was, Vietnamese people. But I was the one that was just really interested in these Asian cultures. And so I was uh, in this monastery in Korea, studying there as a monk <clears throat> and um, uh, in the, in, that was in 1984. And uh, this was uh, a, a long retreat uh, we did where we got up at about 2.45 every morning and started the day and um, uh, meditated all day until nine o'clock at night, a tr tr traditional three-month retreat. Again, very privileged to be able to be with uh, the Korean people and learn so much from them and these great uh, meditation masters came, eventually came back, decided to go back into society. I got my PhD at Berkeley uh, in 19, whenever it was 1988, something like that. And I focused on educating intuition. So I wanted to bring the meditation aspect to education. I was told I wouldn't not be able to do that, but I found a way in my dissertation actually on uh, on educating intuition in adults was nominated as the best dissertation at Berkeley that year. Uh, there's a lot, I have lots of stories I could tell about um, the possibilities that we have in academia and the way academia has been corrupted. Uh, it, it was really a, a battle to go through and, and, and um, fight my way <laughs> upstream to be able to do this, but, uh, but it all worked out, uh, I think, really well. And, uh, and so then eventually, uh, that's my father. He passed away rather young uh, because um, where he was working, there was uh, asbestos and it uh, eventually destroyed his lungs. The, the plant, the old mill in Maynard, or the beacon, the newspaper was housed when we were young. 
but my brother, my, uh, my sister and her children uh, eventually all went vegan, which is great. I ended up teaching college for a number of years in San Francisco living. And then uh, I decided to leave that after teaching college uh, in yeah, San Francisco Bay area and lived in a Volkswagen bus uh, for a number of years, traveling and um, giving concerts and lectures on developing intuition all around the United States and Canada. Uh, and then I went to Russia. This is actually uh, Ukraine. It's kind of interesting. I gave uh, lectures in Ukraine uh, and Armenia and in Russia and other places in Europe, uh, uh, helping people to develop intuition. This has been my real interest is connecting with our inner guidance system. So we're not uh, completely relying on outside authorities who very often may not be correct. How do we know? How do we know actually? So um, I taught college courses in epistemology. I, my PhD is in philosophy of education. So I taught a lot of courses in philosophy, uh, humanities, uh, creativity, mythology, world religions, and um, so forth. So uh, this was in uh, Korea. Then I met this woman, Madeline, <laughs> in Switzerland, and this all these travels. And she came over uh, and um, in the early 1990s and moved into the, my Volkswagen bus. <laughs> so we lived together in this little tiny Volkswagen bus for a while. And then we found this place in Northern California in Healdsburg in Sonoma County. We got married. And I always say <laughs> smartest thing I ever did besides um, going vegan was marrying Madeline. So she's a wonderful partner, an artist like my mother was also an artist who went to Rhode Island School of Design, a watercolor painter. <laughs> and uh, so we lived for several years up in Northern California. We created a lot of babies, a lot of albums, actually. She came over to do the art and we got a grand piano and we recorded albums of original piano music. And then after three years and creating about five or six albums, we decided we should go on the road and travel. So we lived for 18 years <laughs> in this RV that we created. We put solar panels on the roof and we lived in this. And it was a great experience, really living in a tiny house, basically living in 200 square feet of space uh, and, tra and traveling north in the spring and south in the fall. And every weekend we were in some city in the United States or Canada giving lectures promoting uh, intuition and then promoting veganism, of course, and uh, doing concerts and art exhibits, individual sessions of music and art. We found the healing power of music and art. We would really uh, get into that pretty intensely. We would tune into people and do individual sessions where I would tune into a, a person or a couple and create a 30 minute uh, CD of music and Madeline would create an, a painting uh, of their symbols. And the people found this to be literally physically healing. They would heal from breathing problems or various things or psychologically, emotionally healing. And we still hear from people years later that they listen to their music every day and they look at the painting and they find uh, how healing it is. So I, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, the healing power of consciousness. I always have found it actually works very well. Uh, in my own life, and uh, it's something that I think is really ignored in our society to our detriment. Um, so yeah, so this is our, our rolling home that <laughs> we lived in all those years. And um, these are some of Madeline's, uh, th these paintings that I mentioned. Now this was like we were, we would at a weekend, we would go in, uh, say Atlanta, Georgia, or Nashville, Tennessee, or Salt Lake City, or wherever it was. And we would do workshops and concerts and then people would sign up and then we would do paintings and music and then she would frame them for people. So this was after, this was like on a Tuesday after we did on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, or maybe on a Wednesday after we'd done a bunch of sessions. So these are indiv people's individual, uh, like they're the symbols that she tuned into for people. It's really very interesting, I think, how that would work. <clears throat> so, um, so it was beautiful. We, we spent a lot of time in nature. I've spent a lot of time. She would go to Switzerland every summer and I would head into the mountains and, uh, and live in a tent. And, and uh, I really wrote a lot of the World Peace Diet actually in a tent uh, somewhere in the forest. <clears throat> and um, well, it, was a, it was a very, um, it was like the earth writing the book in many ways. I felt like it came from beyond just my uh, academic studies. It came up from a lot of, you know, thousands of hours of meditation and these meditation centers 
and um, and from nature. Yeah, that's yeah. There, I would do that. I would live in a tent and and write. And um, so, and then the World Peace Diet came out uh, back in 2005, and then <laughs> that kind of changed everything. Then we were, besides doing the concerts and workshops every weekend, we were traveling and doing lectures promoting veganism. This was in Houston when the book first came out, was launched. And uh, that, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I would print out the, uh, our lecture schedule, thousands and thousands of events we put on all over the United States and worldwide. This is uh, a list, you can kind of see how long it is. <laughs> and it's actually longer now. But um, so we, we've really have been so blessed. That's all I can say. I mean, I, I feel like I've had the most blessed life a human being could possibly have to be able to just, and I think it was because I left home, you know, I left home. I didn't really do what I was trained to do. I was trained to take over a newspaper chain and it would have been probably a great life. I would have had a lot of money. My father had a hundred employees and a very thriving business. But I, something else was calling, and so I, I left all that and um, and just wandered off into the world and and made my own you know, lived with no money. I mean, quite quite a lot. I remember living in Huntsville, Alabama, in this Zen center. And if I, I wanted to buy a book, I, I went into the bookstore and and I painted their bathroom, and they we traded for a book. You know, <laughs> I, I wanted a Krishnamurti book. I remember. So anyway, it's. Um, uh, to learn to live without money. It was uh, kind of one of the things I was doing early in my life. But, um, you know, the whole idea is to just to give and to find our unique way of giving and to be able to do that. So um, this is my, this was a little later. That's my mother. She passed away last year at the age of 90 something, 94, I think. But she was vegan uh, for her, um, the last probably 25 years of her life. So is Madeline's mother also. They both went vegan in their 70s. And uh, that's my sister and her daughter and her little kids. And so they're all vegan. Everybody's vegan. Uh, Christy, my, Laura's my sister. Christy um, lives in Connecticut. She's got four little kids at four. Yeah, four or five. I think four <laughs> um, uh, kids. And they're all vegan from birth and thriving amazingly. Well, and um, so, uh, you know, it, it took 15 years, you know, of, of me kind of haranguing them <laughs> before they went vegan. And I can't say it was my, uh, my doing. I think it was, uh, as Laura said, the Lord came and, uh, and, and told me to go vegan. And I think um, I'm just uh, so, so blessed that whenever we get together, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and that's, yeah, that's Madeline's mother who lived to be about 98. Uh, and she was visited us in Switzerland at the age of 95. She flew over here and this is our house in Northern California. We eventually moved out of the, our RV. We finally found a place here in Northern California where we're living now. And, uh, so one of the things we've been doing is putting on, uh, retreats and trainings, uh, world peace diet trainings. We used to do it a lot, of course, pre COVID, this was the first one we did in Michigan. These are all people who became World Peace Diet facilitators. And uh, to spread the message of the World Peace Diet of a, of a spiritual approach to vegan living. And uh, this is another, uh, this is a, a World Peace Diet uh, class in uh, Cincinnati. Uh, Tom and Grace Tate, Mark Stroud, all these wonderful people who are pioneers in spreading the vegan message uh, and have really helped so many people. So it's been really great. We had this online training. We did lots of uh, live trainings as well for people to understand what I call deep veganism, which is understanding the spiritual, psychological, social, anthropological, historical, environmental, economic, political dimensions of our food system so we can thrive as vegans in a non-vegan world and also be effective advocates and, and share this message with others. So um, this was actually at the farm in Tennessee. We did a, tr a World Peace Diet training like 35 years later, whatever it was, after we'd been there as a, as a young hippie, of all these hippies. The farm is still there. It's still going strong. And so we did a World Peace Diet training. These are some of the people that were for, joined us for that training at the farm. And it was such an amazing experience to have that full, full circle 
um, experience the, the, um, the fellow that I had met, you know, way back when I, we had no money, we were walking with a backpack and we came in to this uh, community in Kentucky and they were affiliated with the farm. And we eventually walked, get down to the farm in Tennessee. And then he ended up there. He was the guy actually that's organized this whole thing. And I didn't realize it until it was after it was over. And he was the one who actually told me about veganism uh, way back in 1975 and how they were eating lower on the food chain. And he was wearing vegetarian shoes, which blew my mind. The idea, wow, you can even, you even don't wear leather. Wow. That's like, it was so radical. I was like, <laughs> but I, I was really uh, inspired um, by, by the whole thing. So uh, we went back and, and did a, a training session there. We've done them in Hawaii and we've done them all over the world. That was a cake someone made for one of our trainings, <laughs> World Peace Diet Cake. Uh, this was in Ireland. Uh, we did a training there. Uh, a woman had a sanctuary, and this was a, her turkey that lived in the house with her. And um, yeah, she created this whole movement of um, her name is Sandra Higgins, uh, reached thousands of millions of people. She's a World Peace Diet facilitator. Uh, so it's it's really wonderful. We would we would create um, food and give lectures and travel. That's Madeline. These are some of her. She has an uh, intuitive kitchen. Many videos on creating healthy, delicious vegan food, whole food, organic, plant based way of eating and living. And that's Madeline's passion uh, is food and and color and making the the, the meals beautiful. So we've been to gosh, dozens and dozens of sanctuaries all over the world. And it's really interesting to go to these sanctuaries, give lectures and support them. They're doing great educational work where people come and meet the animals and see them as beings, not as objects and commodities. Uh, so we've been to these places in Australia, Tasmania, China, India, all over Europe, um, North America, South America. And um, this is actually in California, actually. And uh, so I, we love these sanctuaries <laughs> where you can actually be with the animals. Um, we ended up, after the World Peace Diet came out, people started volunteering to translate the World Peace Diet in all these different languages. It was always done by the local volunteers. Nobody got paid. It's been now translated into 17 languages, I think, or 18 now. And uh, this was in Taiwan. I gave... In Taiwan, back in, I think, 2014, perhaps the largest lecture ever been given in the history of veganism. There was over 2,000 people came to hear a vegan talk just out of the blue. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I think v Taiwan is one of the most um, vegan countries in the world. They have a whole chain of organic vegan uh, stores. They are started by one of the spiritual uh, Buddhist groups. They've got over 100 stores now all over Taiwan. It's an amazing story. I mean, I've, I've been so blessed to learn about veganism by traveling the world and visiting vegan communities all over the world. I know, I, I mean, no one gets this opportunity really, but this was actually being able to speak. This was the, these are top people in their government of Taiwan. They were, they had a, a high level panel discussion. The former premier of Taiwan was there. The president of the Senate was there talking about how we have to promote veganism in schools and, and, uh, and uh, subsidize vegan food and so forth. It was so inspiring to see, well, I mean, <laughs> how could that ever happen in the United States you know, or, or other countries? Uh, but it's difficult. We have such a powerful animal lobby here, animal agriculture lobby. They don't have an animal agriculture lobby in Taiwan, so they can kind of just do what they want. <clears throat> so, um, now, this was a, a protest in Australia against the killing sharks. Thousands and thousands of people showed up. I remember, again, this was back probably about 2015 or 14 um, to, to protest against the killing of sharks. And uh, this was in Perth, Australia, giving lectures. So this, uh, this is a sanctuary, uh, a famous woman there who's uh, known for wearing a baseball hat and, and, um, and uh, famous for the saying that, uh, you know, why, if, if I could live a healthy life without harming others, why wouldn't I do it? Right. And uh, so she's a, a big inspiration to a lot of people. This is Madeline with one of our good friends and Madeline loves to knit. This is a the famous woman uh, in Australia, Patty Marks, who's, who pioneered open rescue. The idea of you, you, you go in and you just rescue animals and have the media there and uh, talk about it. And she's always getting thrown in jail. Um, 
but she has this little uh, animal sanctuary in, in uh, I think it was in Melbourne or somewhere. And uh, this was in uh, uh, New Zealand. This is Gentle World, which is a vegan community. They have a, a beautiful land in New Zealand and also land on the big island of Hawaii. A lot of, they train a lot of people in veganism. Uh, they've been uh, a vegan community for over 30 years. Uh, a lot of, we have a lot of friends there. And for them, it's um, a very powerful spiritual practice. And I think we need uh, vegan communities. I mean, it's a great place. I went vegan because of going to a vegan community, right? I mean, the farm in, in Tennessee in 1975, that's what it was. It was a vegan community. So any way we can create community, whether it's online communities or vegetarian societies or temporary communities like VegFest, get together and share these ideas and then teach others so they can go out and share these ideas with other people. So it's very inspiring to see uh, the work that people have been doing all over the world. This is uh, in China. I mean, that's where veganism actually started was in China. Uh, this is in Korea, South Korea. I went back 35 years later or something after being a monk. And uh, it was really wonderful to go and, and spread the vegan message at the monastery. This is in a monastery, actually, in Korea. People came and they even brought a piano in for, for me to play the piano um, and to meditate together and to talk about compassion and the karuna, the great compassion, uh, and how when we awaken compassion in our hearts, our whole body begins to heal. We begin to heal the body of humanity we begin to heal the body of the earth. It's all one body, the body of our consciousness that manifests in various levels and in various ways. Uh, this is a, yeah, this is one a traditional vegan meal in Korea, and uh, again, just meeting these incredible vegan activists from all over the world and the work that people are doing. It's so beautiful. And these are vegan uh, nuns. In Korea, this is this is in uh, the French part of Switzerland. This woman is uh, this is the French version of uh, the World Peace Diet. Again, this woman is incredible. You know, she every Wednesday she cooks a huge amount of food, brings it into the into the town, uh, the, the small city where they live, and she just basically offers it for free to people, a vegan meal. And uh, and she's she she's the publisher of all these books. She's uh, uh, it's called Lage Dumb. It's one of the, it's a major publisher, actually. Her father started it and she's carrying it on. But um, yeah, it's uh, amazing to see the, the way that these vegan people uh, have found ways to spread the message through providing food to people. This is in Italy. This is a great, uh, amazing place. This guy in, uh, inherited a, a huge cattle farm and he's turned it into a vegan healing retreat center in Northern Italy near Assisi. And so I could, um, you know, give lectures there. And again, it's a, also a spiritual center, um, wonderful, uh, based in the, the teachings from India, the Brahma Kumaris uh, group. If you're familiar with Brahma Kumaris, it's an international group. They promote vegetarianism and veganism. We've spoken in a lot of their centers all around the world as well. Um, there's so many groups that are doing great work. This is Damanhur. If you've heard of Damanhur, this is an amazing community, one of the largest communities in the world uh, in Northern Italy. And uh, we gave uh, lectures promoting veganism there. They're, they're not a vegan community, but a lot of the people are vegan and they're interested in it. They have their own currency. They have their own store. They have people from all over the world are there. It's a thriving community. They build what the um, New York Times called the eighth wonder of the world, which is these caves in the earth and in the mountains that are gorgeous i mean huge massive caves that are that are painted and with sculptures and uh it's just absolutely mind-blowing what they've done uh and they do lots of experiments with plants and communicating with plants um so this is <laughs> this is in pisa italy where they had a sanctuary right in a public park these young people, they just, there was a public park in the city of Pisa and they turned it, they, they got permission from the local authorities to make an animal sanctuary. So they have pigs and some cows and horses and uh, goats and animals and people come and, and go vegan, right? I mean, it's, uh, this, uh, oh, this is in Dubai. I mean, this is, you know, Muslim country. Um, we gave um, lectures there. Uh, promoting veganism. And uh, there's, a, there's a thriving vegan community. 
Uh, and of many Muslim people, people think that Muslims are not interested in veganism, but they, they definitely are. Compassion for animals. It's a very... Uh, Wonderful to see uh, this kind of thing. This, oh, this is in Africa, uh, South Africa. This is a sanctuary in South Africa uh, where we stayed and, and they sponsored uh, retreats and lectures. Uh, we did uh, trainings in the World Peace Diet also. And um, of course, hung out with people. And uh, this is also, uh, I think this is in, uh, where is this? This is in Africa also. South Africa. And this, this man uh, owns a vegan restaurant and works on, on the Sea Shepherd. Are you familiar with Sea Shepherd Society? He's uh, actually a captain of one of the ships, one of the Sea Shepherd, Shepherd ships. And he does that half time. And then how the half time he has this, this uh, vegan restaurant. Um, this is on a, yeah, these, are, these are people from Israel. Israel, this woman in the middle, um, she started a, a vegan sanctuary in Israel, which was very difficult to do because land is at a premium and they want to have a land where they're going to grow animals that you don't eat, you know, <laughs> and feed them. And, but, uh, the vegan movement is very strong in Israel and they got it. They were successful. And this is in Africa. This was at a, a refuge for, you know, for lions, for white lions, the white lion refuge. Uh, there's this whole thing about white lions and they're being, um, killed off, but they're being, they're, um, they were they have a refuge there for these white lines. Uh, this is all. This is in England at the uh, Vegan Society. You know, the Vegan Society is uh, started by Donald Watson, uh, and he coined the word vegan. And he and his wife back uh, in nineteen forty-five, and um, to a philosophy and way of life which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practicable all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. So Donald Watson's a huge inspiration to me and to a lot of people, very humble man, uh, a gardener and uh, uh, someone who just lived the teachings. And uh, we learned a lot from these people about veganic agriculture and they're doing a lot with veganic agriculture. We have a food forest here in Northern California in many ways inspired by what's called in England stock free agriculture, not using any bone meal or blood meal or fish meal or manure, but you don't need animal inputs to create a healthy um, garden. <clears throat> and uh, so it was great to learn from those people. And I'm going to go quickly here. These are, yeah, it's so neat how they had the kids dress up as vegetables. And this is in China and to really learn uh, this is an ancient Probably this is in China. This is a place where uh, they make tofu and tempeh. And um, this is an amazing fellow who just his whole passion is to spread the vegan message. He's in, this is in China and he travels. He, he just lives uh, on the road walking with a pack and he gives away uh, literature promoting veganism. Uh, and he's been to literally thousands of towns and cities all over China and Tibet, spreading the vegan message, an uh, absolutely amazing, inspiring human being. Uh, I, I have a book called Buddhism and Veganism, and he has a, an essay in there, actually. This is, in, this is Thanksgiving in Taiwan, right? They made a whole turkey out of uh, vegetables. And uh, this was, and they, they're great. They know how to promote this. This was on, on, main, on, their, uh, on their evening news, right? We were on the evening news talking about veganism. Uh, and, and they had these fashions, you know, they had a big fashion show with women dressed up in, in vegan costumes and, and really, you know, celebrating uh, vegetables. And <laughs> this is the book, The World Peace Diet in, uh, in traditional uh, Chinese. It's in, there's two different types of Chinese language. And this is, this is I think, is in Taiwan. The uh, wonderful um, group spirit in uh, many Asian countries is something that we just don't have here. I mean, it's, I have to say it, it's, they, they just know how to work together in an incredible way and cooperate and put on huge events just so easily. It's, it was amazing. I mean, day after day, I'd show up in a lecture hall with 500 or a thousand people and they'd be all smiling and happy and just making it happen. Oh yeah. This is in uh, Vietnam, in Hanoi. <laughs> we, 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 this is on the way to a lecture on the back of a motorcycle. That was a, quite a thrill going through the streets of Hanoi. And this is a, the meal we had after the lecture. And yeah, Hanoi, you know, it's, uh, it, it's against the law, actually, to, to question dairy products. And uh, I sort of broke the law there a little bit. 
But um, yeah, the, it's the power of the dairy industry is incredible around the world. I mean, they've gotten in, uh, but it was still good to spread the message. And uh, yeah, this is a these are stores. This is the store in China where where uh, everything is just uh, there for the for people to to come and take you. There's no there's nobody there's nobody there. You just you just go in and put your money in, and that's <laughs> all in the honor system. And uh, Green Monday is a, is a whole movement, actually. It started, I think, in um, Hong Kong, but it spread from Hong Kong. It's all around. It's, it's in uh, Singapore and all over Southeast Asia. And they put on quite a few of the lectures that I gave, this Green Monday group. It's a thriving vegan educational movement. Uh, this is somewhere over there. This is in India, actually. This is in India. We gave lectures all over India. This is yeah, someone who, who looks a lot like Gandhi and who was a, a great vegan activist and uh, came to my lecture. And, and yeah, and the, yeah, the cows really suffer, I have to say, in India. I mean, it's really too bad to see what they go through um, on the streets of India. And uh, eat, sleep, save animals, repeat. Yeah, this is, the, this is a, at a Jain lecture. The Jains are fantastic and, and they're, they're really promoting uh, veganism actually quite a bit in, in we spoke also in many cities in the United States and in Europe uh, sponsored by Jain people. Uh, this is a retreat I did in India, uh, World Peace Diet Retreat. The Indian people are so open to veganism. They, they, the only thing of course for them is the dairy. And uh, so we had long discussions about the dairy industry and, and how um, integrated it is in their society and how we can help free uh, people from the addiction to dairy. Uh, we had, yeah, we had huge events in India and, uh, um, and a lot of, a lot of media. This is really, that's one of the things I found in China and India. We reached literally millions of people through the television and through newspapers. Uh, they really cover you know, you know, things and we travel all over the countries. And many times we've been to China uh, three times and done huge, really big tours every day, at least one or two lectures in a different city every day. And uh, with very large audiences, I mean, they get big crowds coming. It's, and Madeline would do cooking uh, demos that would be televised on television. Um, we would be greeted. They're so wonderful, the people every day like this. And they would create these magnificent stages, uh, so artistic with, you know, just beautiful um, and they love meditating. Uh, we would, I would leave, you know, lead meditations um, always. And uh, I think that's, uh, uh, they have this China Fit uh, program, which is huge. And millions of people involved with that. It's connected somewhat, I think, to PCRM too, here in the United States. And they sponsored some of our lectures as well. This was at a monastery, I think, in, um, in the Southern China. And uh, just um, able to, you know, just go and uh, bring this message. And it's part of their tradition. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Veganism started in China, basically, as, um, as a way of living to not harm animals. They never did dairy. So it was uh, part of the Buddhist teaching and Confucian teaching we discovered. Uh, so... Um, they're very playful and dress up. And so these are some of the, uh, uh, this is the story, the airplane story. I mean, maybe I'll tell that airplane story. I wrote an article about it, but um, they loved it. I mean, it was such an amazing thing uh, that the airplane, well, I should maybe, maybe I should tell it. Okay. The story was just briefly, you know, when, I, when Madeline and I were living, when she first came over from, um, from Switzerland, we were living in this little house in Northern California before we got married. And then we got married there also. And at one point we were having an argument <clears throat> about something. And, um, and so I was having a hard time <laughs> talking to her. And I remember um, I just, I, I, you know, because, because I guess, the, well, anyway, they asked us, you know, um, when we were in China, one of the things we were giving these lectures and they said, gosh, you know, you two people, you have such an amazing relationship. They tell us about, how you're so happy together, you know, how does it, what is it, you know, how does it work? And so I told the story about how we had had this, uh, you know, argument when we first got together and we were um, having a hard time 
communicating. And so, but I didn't want to have anything, uh, any, you know, misunderstanding. So uh, I, I didn't, I couldn't bring myself to talk to her, but I wrote a little note on a piece of paper. Then I folded it up like a, like an airplane. And I just threw it, you know, <laughs> over to her and it landed on her desk and she picked it up and she read the note and, you know, and we made up and, you know, and it was, it was kind of a, um, it was, and I said, the whole idea is, you know, just to try to be understanding with your partner and, 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 and send love notes, you know, and, and, uh, and so we told that story and didn't think too much about it later. And then like the next maybe two days later or something, we, we came to a city and I noticed, um, what was it? They had, um, they had paper, uh, all these places they would have, they would serve tea. And so the people were at desks and they had paper. And at one point, um, they uh, folded up the paper and made airplanes out of it. <laughs> so, uh, so the people uh, suddenly started throwing these airplanes. Like they, they, they told the people from another city, told all the people in this city about this story. And they wanted me to tell the story again. <laughs> and they were all throwing these paper airplanes everywhere. It was like this complete chaos. It was like incredible. The whole place went kind of crazy. And they, at the end, they were singing a song. And when they finished the song, they, they threw all these paper airplanes. And it was one of those moments, you know, it's kind of like uh, something to really think about because everything we do is planting a seed. And, and, I, and I really got it. It was like, there we were, the two, these two human beings, man, you know, me from the United States, her from Switzerland. We had a whole different background. We had different ideas about men and women and life in general from different cultures. We were working to be in harmony together. And I just did a little tiny thing. I just planted it. I just threw an, air, an airplane, right? This little thing. And she received it. And then she threw, threw one back. And, and um, when we plant, that was this little thing. But because of that, 30, you know, 30, whatever it was, 25 years later, on the other side of the world, you know, hundreds of people are throwing paper airplanes <laughs> and laughing and being, you know, and that's something to really understand that everything we do, we're planting a seed and we don't know where it's going to, what's going to happen because of our word, because of our gesture, because of the smile we give thousands of people can be affected really millions in animals. And it, we are part of an infinitely interconnected web of life. So it's just really important. I think to realize that, Every day is a precious opportunity to make a difference, a positive difference. And you never know what's going to happen out of that. It's still, the, the ripples are still going, you know, it's still, ripples are always rippling out from our body, speech, and mind. And um, so these kids love to dance around and, and celebrate fruits and vegetables, making it fun, you know, making it, like making the whole thing fun. This is, um, I think, in... Uh, this is in mainland China again. This is, um, I think, at a monastery. Yeah, this is at a, a some of these, mon these monasteries are great. These Buddhist monasteries, they're all vegan. The monks are vegan. There's no dairy. There's no meat. There's no eggs. I mean, they're really vegan. And so the people come there and they learn about veganism. They learn about spirituality. And uh, so these are radiating centers of veganism. And I wish, I kind of wish and we, that our churches and synagogues and everything were radiating centers of veganism. I mean, the compassion, the, the religion of the work country or of, of a culture is the repository for morality, right? So this is, should be learning veganism, learning compassion for animals, but they are actually in, in China. Oh, and also Confucianism. This was so interesting. This was in Chufu, which is a big city south of uh, Beijing. And and we went to Chufu and gave lectures. And then we, they, they brought us to this community, this big community. This is like a multi-million dollar town. They're building that's all vegan based on Confucian principles. Confucius apparently was the first one to write down or to say, whatever you want for yourself, basically don't do to others, which you don't want to have done to yourself. You know, the, the golden rule, basically the golden rule, which is the universal spiritual teaching of all the world religions was a big part of Confucianism to honor the elders and honor children and don't do anything to harm the society. 
And so out of those teachings, they have this veganic uh, town they're building. Uh, this was, yeah, this was giving lectures there in this town. Um, this is the little, had these little cabins. You can, they're beautiful, all made out of wood. Um, this is, this is it. This is the, the, how it is. It's all vegan. They have schools and a retirement center and people living in fields and grow the food veganically with no bone meal, no blood meal, no manure. They're doing veganic agriculture. I mean, it's amazing. This is a, okay, this is somewhere else. This is a, um, a Buddhist monastery again, where they uh, teach. We have these, may all beings live free. Our circle of compassion was another thing we started with Judy Carmen. And we have these, uh, we, we give these away all over the United States, all over the world. And they hang them <laughs> as banners. A piece, that's Judy Carmen's project that we love supporting. Um, this, was, um, this was just a, a, fruit, a, a vegan food uh, competition in, um, down in the Southern uh, China. Just look at this. I mean, these are all vegan foods, the creativity that, that the people have. <laughs> I mean, I just love this. This is, you know, this was back in probably 2017 or something. Um, but I'll just kind of zip to the, but they, they just, they've been making vegan food for hundreds and hundreds of years. It started in the, in these uh, Buddhist monasteries, they would make, they wanted to please their, their donors, right? The donors are wealthy. They're giving donations to support the monks. So the monks want to give them a nice feast, but it has to be vegan. So they invented all the thing, you know, the, the vegan chicken and vegan fish and vegan pork and vegan everything. They invented all this hundreds of years ago. And uh, in order to please the, the meat eating donors with something that tasted like meat, but was, was, had, was compassionate. Uh, this is going back to the very roots. Uh, uh, and like the monastery I lived in when I was in Korea was a vegan community, no meat, dairy, or eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, no killing of insects or animals. It's, it's living ahimsa or nonviolence. And so these are all, this is the way they create their food. I mean, it's beautiful uh, presentations. And um, anyway, this is a vegan restaurant in, in mainland China. Uh, and uh, this is in back in Switzerland again. We traveled all over Europe many, many times, giving lectures all over Europe, Eastern Europe. This is in Greece, actually, at a, at a big animal liberation march for the animals uh, back in 2019, I believe it was, speaking to actually thousands of people. This is one of their, uh, the veg fest they have in Athens, uh, went from 5,000 people the first year to 10,000 people the second year. This was the third year they had 15,000 people at this veg fest. It's huge. Uh, this is the uh, yeah, Animal Liberation March uh, in Athens. Um, this is in, um, <laughs> I forget, this is in uh, Hungary, I believe, in Budapest or somewhere. Um, traveling around uh, with our backpacks all over um, these Eastern Europe. This is in Eastern Europe. This is in, yeah, this is in um, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Vegan movement everywhere. I mean, the vegans are, this is in Serbia. <clears throat> this is in Serbia right here. This is in um, uh, Belgrade uh, and um, all these different places in Eastern Europe. This is in Germany. Uh, the, the, they have this big uh, chain of vegan restaurants you know, all over Germany and it's kind of famous. Uh, this is in, uh, yeah, this is in Norway. <laughs> the uh, vegan movement is thriving in Norway. We've, the book's been translated, the World Peace Diet, into Norwegian. It's been translated into all these languages. It's been translated into Serbian, and Slovenian, and Croatian, and all these different languages. So, um, you know, so it's great to go there. And so that's that's pretty much it. This is our. We traveled around the world many times with just this, just a back, just a hand carry on. That's it. That's all we had to give all our lectures and do all our thing. <laughs> just a little carry on. And uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. I'll, I'll go ahead now and, and um, segue into just a couple of things, just briefly. Um, I, I talked about this last, I think on Tuesday, physics, the five dimensions of health and how they're all interconnected. So I won't go into that now, but just to remember this, this is the key thing that everything's interconnected and our communities are interconnected. Our, the way we interact with animals and nature, our spirituality, our psychology, uh, the environment, our society, it's all interconnected. And then to understand the history of this, that when we started herding animals, we planted the seeds of all these things. Animals were reduced. 
the rising of a wealthy elite class, uh, capitalism as a as a way of owning the meat of a wealthy elite, owning the means of production of wealth, controlling society. Um, war as the desire for more cows, slavery of animals leading to slavery of humans, which is still present today, the domination of the feminine, uh, which is what animal agriculture actually is. It's, it's the breeding, reducing the female to a mere breeder and the devastating impact that this actually has on, uh, on us uh, as well, on, on women, on boys, men too. And the boys are reduced to being macho, male, hard and tough and disconnected. It's devastating on every level. This is this is the de demon at the core of our culture. It's hurting animals. It's uh, and people are realizing this all over the world. You know, we our mission is to spread this message to understand the consequences of animal agriculture, not only in, in the outer world but in the inner world. What it does to our consciousness, what it does to the devastation to the outer world, and um, but also to our consciousness, how it reduces our intelligence. And of course, we're not just making a critique of a system that's completely obsolete and ridiculous. I mean, just absurd uh, to be growing, you know, killing animals for food. It's it just makes no, it's completely irrational, anti-rational, but, but we have this wonderful alternative, right? We can all immediately jump into it. Uh, a, a low L O W F P B, a local organic whole food plant-based way of eating and living. That's what vegan living is. It's based on ahimsa, nonviolence, and it leads obviously clearly to abundance, to health, uh, in ecosystems, economies, people, justice, freedom, equality, harmony, and peace. Everything can flow. It's a beckoning doorway that is right in front of us. Each one of us can walk through that doorway and help bring our entire society through the doorway. It's, there's nothing stopping us except fear and uh, the, the fear of change. And the, um, the inertia and momentum of a toxic system that's been going on for 10,000 years of hurting animals, hurting them, H-U-R-T and H-E-R-D, hurting them, it's the same thing. And uh, we, we uh, destroy our own happiness. And so uh, diabetes, dead zones, pandemics, rainforest destruction, violence, global warming, disease of all kinds, starvation, uh, water problems, all these things, one single industry causing so much harm. So Madeline is the, the wonderful artist who captures these animals and uh, the beauty that they that they have to share and and the fact that we can eat like this. We can eat beautiful, wonderfully delicious and fragrant and attractive foods that give us all the nutrients, all the vitamins, the minerals, the starch, the uh, essential fatty acids, the proteins, the amino acids, the fiber. We, that, that's food for us. We know that. We feel that intuitively. This, when we look at her, we don't say, oh gosh, you know, yum, yum, yum. That's not, our, that's not a human way of being. That's, when you, that's a perversion of a human being to, to look at a, a being and, and start salivating. That doesn't happen. We have to hide what we're eating because we're ashamed of it and we're disgusted by it. If we actually had to eat it, we'd be disgusted by raw flesh. If we see roadkill by the side of the road, we don't run up to it and want to eat it, right? We stay away. We, <laughs> we go to the other side of the road. That's natural human wisdom. These beings are beings. They're chewing and they're eating and they're living their lives. And uh, when we understand that, when we see how they're celebrating their lives in this world and how uh, beautiful really they are and how in harmony uh, things are on this earth, it's like, how do we human beings find our harmony? The giraffe is the symbol of nonviolent communication. Giraffe has the highest perspective and has the largest heart of any animal on, on the earth. And uh, so we love, we love giraffes. Giraffes are going, being driven into extinction, just like lions and zebras and all the animals in Africa because factory farming, we saw it when, when we were in Africa, how Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King are spreading all over Africa and now they're cutting down rainforests there and they're, they're fighting, they're, they're killing off all the elephants. The elephants are now their enemy because the elephants are, tr are trampling their, their corn that they've got everywhere. They've got all this, and Bill Gates has moved in with GMO agriculture and they're just massively destroying Africa and killing all the wildlife. 
for animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is a war against nature. Look at what happened to the buffalo. They were wiped out. And uh, so we have to understand that very clearly that the, the animals of this earth do not have a future. Human beings do not have a future if we're going to uh, be harming them. Look at the horses. I mean, think of horses. You know, when, you, when I go into Whole Foods and I see this, uh, these signs for uh, grass-fed beef, you know, grass-fed beef is the main reason for the complete destruction of the wild horse herds in the United States. The wild free-living horses in the Western United States are being rounded up and killed mainly for grass-fed beef. They, they want to have all the, the, the cows out there. Uh, they don't want them in feedlots. They want them out on the, out on the land. So that means you got to get rid of the horses. And so the horses can no longer live their lives freely as they have for hundreds of years. They're being uh, all rounded up and killed. And uh, it's really a huge tragedy, actually. And it's driven again by by so-called free range agriculture. And these beautiful animals there, I love how Madeline's able to capture the spirit of these animals. What's happening in Australia, the, the, the fires, the floods, the wiping out of, um, of, of the native uh, animals and how they're hanging on, right? They're hanging on to the earth. And we humans, it's animal agriculture that's the main cause of the destruction of their habitat and their lives. They're looking at us to help protect the earth. They're depending on us. They're, they're really, it's really up to us um, to be able to, to do this and to appreciate the magnificence of nature and of the animals around us and the beauty that they bring to our lives and the incredible capacities they have, the wisdom that they have. So, um, so that's, I think, the, the key thing to remember is that you know, these animals uh, have... Uh, a purpose. And this is a, this is a cow um, that we met, this is a painting, Madeline, of a cow uh, named Emily, uh, who uh, escaped from a slaughterhouse in Massachusetts, jumped over a six foot wall in the slaughterhouse and got out somehow of the slaughterhouse and ran into the forest. They tried to catch her and they couldn't. And she actually lived with the deer in the winter. And then eventually was, uh, it ended up at a at a, at a sanctuary in Massachusetts called the Peace Abbey. And she was there and, and so many people met her and a Hindu monk came by and the, she had a hole in her ear where a number had been and he put a blessing cord in her ear. Um, and she converted many people to veganism just by her presence. People would come and see her. So I think it's beautiful. I'll go ahead and stop the um, slideshow here and start talking. There's a lot more I want to talk about. <laughs> um, but thank you all for, um, for uh, your kind attention. And I guess uh, I'm all set here uh, with everything. I can probably shut this down here too. And um, all right. So I'd like to talk about, about health here. And um, I appreciate your, um, your kind attention with everything so far. That's a little, like a little background. And um, the, uh, the thing I want to emphasize here is that uh, you, you're hearing through this whole Real Truth About Health conference a lot about healthy food and other aspects of health. So in my own life, I wanted to share some, some of the main principles and, and tips, I guess, uh, on healthy living. So in, regarding food, um, basically, there's, there's a number of things. So one important thing, of course, like I said earlier, is local, organic, whole food, plant-based food. So we don't eat foods that come from factories. It's, I mean, we a little bit, but not much. We don't buy processed oils. We do buy tahini and peanut butter, a little, you know, a few things, because those are whole foods. And um, so I think uh, it's really a great idea to just minimize the amount of processed foods that you're eating. This is what we've been doing. Madeline has lots of videos in her uh, Intuitive Kitchen series on just cooking foods from scratch. So we have uh, a lot of uh, backup food. So I recommend right now we're in a situation, 2022, where the supply chains of, uh, of, of everything and food, including food are, are being broken. And so I would recommend getting plenty of food. 
uh, as a backup. We have enough food to live for a year, for sure. Um, so if we didn't buy any food, we could live for a year. And I think you should, it's a good idea. Uh, we have, you can buy you know, bulk rice, organic rice. We buy rice from um, companies that don't use asbestos. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, not, not that they use it, but that, that it's organic, but not from the United States. Because we found asbestos uh, is in, Madeline can tell, she's very sensitive. She, <laughs> she can tell, she gets a headache if there's any asbestos. Um, so, um, so it's really important to buy, uh, I think, rice from, from outside the United States. And um, so organic rice, uh, quinoa, millet, um, spelt, uh, kasha, you know, grains, uh, and then lentils and split peas, uh, 25 pound bags, 50 pound bags, you can put them into these large uh, five gallon food grain plastic containers with lids, special lids. Um, that spin on <clears throat> and you can seal, seal up the grains. So you store that stuff. I mean, it'll last um, for several years and you can use it, but it's really good to have plenty of food nowadays for yourself and maybe for neighbors. I mean, it's going to be, we're, we're just, I would say food shortages are on the horizon, the organic vegan food. So get and grains are fantastic. I mean, grains pack a huge punch in terms of having lots of calories, which is really the fuel that our bodies run on. The grains have the hot most calories uh, and beans have are great, you know, lentils, especially, I think. Uh, so just do it in your own way. But that's what we found is it really works well. You know, five you know, food grade, five gallon containers uh, and um, and then these are called gamma, gamma lids that you put on to them and they spin on, they seal up, they're, they're threaded and you can store oats. You know, we have oats. So we have a, a grinder. So we, we have like, um, the wheat berries and the spelt berries. And then, um, we, we have a, it's a stone grind. You can buy, it's not expensive, a few hundred dollars. And you have, you can grind your own grain and make your own flour and then bake the bread immediately or make the pizza or whatever it is from, from fresh ground flour. It's so much more nutritious and much more delicious. I never liked bread that much. And now it's like, wow, I mean, it's amazing. It's really good. If you grind the, just grind it and use it immediately. Same thing. We have an oat flake or you can you buy the oats berries and then you just flake them. You just run them through the flaker and we have it every day. That's what we have our noon meal is just a little thing. It's called, we call it Oatly. So just a little glass, <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's enough. That's all we need uh, of oat, rolled oats. And then Madeline adds some of her magic, you know, some, some, maybe some um, chia seeds uh, and some, maybe a little banana or some kind of fruit or whatever. We have lots of berries in our garden. So we add some things to it, but uh, basically oats. Oats are an amazingly healthy foundational food. It's like a superfood. These grains are fantastic and beans, I think are great. And then of course, vegetables. Um, we have a garden and we have five raised beds. We grow a lot of greens, especially. And then of course, sprouts, we grow our own sprouts. So get, you know, just stock up and you get plenty of sprouting seeds, all kinds of sprouts. We, um, we buy them from, well, there's, there's a bunch of good places. Um, the sprout people in, in California, um, they have these combinations you can buy the Italian mix, the, um, the French mix, the Russian mix, the you know, different mixes of uh, onions are great. Um, of course, uh, alfalfa and um, clover and uh, broccoli and so forth. Uh, so uh, Hippocrates Health Institute, where we spend two months every year, it's basically a sprout bar. You eat a lot of sprouts. Sprouts are living foods. You can grow them yourself on your own counter. When we lived in an RV, it was the only food we could actually grow. You know, we, we grew sprouts. And uh, I have a video on our uh, video channel on YouTube on growing sprouts. It's very easy. It's, just, it's quick and easy, and it's uh, a great way to, to just magnify these little seeds into nice greens and uh, you can do it. It's inexpensive and uh, delicious. So, um, so anyway, so the high, whole idea is to 
uh, eat whole organic foods as much as possible in their natural state, right? And uh, it, it, to reduce the amount of preservatives and, and uh, no factory, keep the factories out of, keep, keep the containers out of it as much as possible. Um, buy vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds in their, in their state and just make foods out of it. It's not, it doesn't take much more time. Once you get the idea how to do it, it's, it's fast, it's easy, and it's an art form. It's delicious. So that's number two. It's, it's like what we're eating is important. And you know, I can talk for too long. We don't have time. I, I don't have time. Um, I can't believe how late it is already. Um, all right. So th th the point is... Um, eat whole organic plant-based foods and you'll get plenty. We have a typically a smoothie in the morning. So we, and we put a lot of, it's mainly greens and celery, a little bit of fruits and berries from our garden and, and mix that up and drink that. that that's really great. And Madeline puts in um, buckwheat. Buckwheat is fantastic. I love buckwheat. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. Um, and then we have uh, some starch and veg veggies for dinner. We don't eat a lot of protein. Some protein is good, but there's protein in everything. So if you want a little tofu or tempeh, but keep, yeah, you don't really need that much. Um, so, but it's not only what we're eating, it's how we are eating. So I just want to emphasize that point to please remember that our food is, you know, eating is a, is a sacred thing. Our food is sacred. So when we're preparing the food, uh, the Indian people understand this prana energy, the energy that we put into the food. If we put in love and caring into the food, it's going to be nurturing for people. So we can do that. We can actually uh, create nurturing food by our intention, by our consciousness. And, and Madeline cooks as a meditation when she's cooking in there, um, I don't bother her. She's, this is her time to meditate, to create something beautiful and nutritious. It's an act. It's the deepest act of love growing food. I mean, farmers should be the highest paid people and chefs, the highest paid. The, I mean, if they're really giving something of, of, of beauty and, and nutrition and love, it's, it's, we, when we take into our physical being, our temple, this is something we would do with mindfulness and with caring. So uh, preparing the food with love, eating it with mindfulness, not just talking about things that don't are irrelevant, kind of uh, being with the food. Uh, it's a very, it, it, it's part of, of a way of living. Uh, what we eat, how we eat, and then also the implements with which that we're using. Uh, we have learned early on, I'm really glad we learned this, that the pans, like we're, we cook some food, right? We're not just complete raw food. I think uh, it's good to eat a lot of raw food, maybe, you know, 70, 75%, maybe, or something like that, but cooked, cooked grains. And, you know, there's a place for that, I think. And, but make sure you pay money to get one good pan, at least that's made from surgical steel. Because what we found is that the metals in pans uh, leach into the food. And people don't buy good quality, even, even expensive pans can, are maybe not that good. Salad Master, Healthcraft, there's one or two companies, maybe one other company, I forget the name, but they use surgical steel that's virgin. You know, so much steel is recycled cars or battleships or who knows what. And, the, and so we've known people who had chronic disease that heal the disease by changing the pans that they were eating. I mean, for sure, never use Teflon or, you know, these coatings. We've, we've looked into this. We spent a lot of time, ceramic, glass, they all have heavy metals. They all have metals. They all have metals that leach. They always leach. When you start cooking, the pores open up and it leaches. So that's, I'm not going to say more, but if you spend, a, you know, three or $400 on one good pan, it'll last for your great grandchildren can use it, right? These surgical steel pans last forever and they're really good. And the food doesn't stick naturally because the pores are so tight. So you can do waterless cooking uh, where the full nutrition and the food is in there. When you cook the vegetables and the grains, you, they, it just stays in. You can learn about it. So learn how to cook food properly. We don't learn the basic things. We don't learn how to eat right. We don't learn how to cook <laughs> really properly. We don't learn how most things. We don't learn how to meditate. The most important things we don't learn. All right. So I want to talk about 
uh, the five elements, like I said earlier, and there's so much, I don't have time, but uh, water. Okay, I'll talk about water a little bit. Um, water is so important. Our body is made up of water. So make sure you're careful about your water. Get good filters, right? I mean, they're fluoridating the water. You do not want to have fluoride in your water. I won't say more, but just it, 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 it just goes right. It shuts down the pineal gland. It calcifies the pineal gland. The pineal gland is the connection to our intuition, our inner wisdom. They, you know, when you want to control people, right? You want to, you want them not connected to their inner wisdom. Then they'll do whatever you tell them to do. They'll trust the authorities. So it's very important to have a good filter. There's companies that make, like we live in an RV, we live in a little tiny micro van, so we're dependent on the on the water wherever we go. Where we live in where we live, there uh, the water comes from a pure aquifer, and it's not fluoridated. So we know the water here is good, and we still filter it. Um, but when we're on the road, we have a filter by a company called Clearly Filtered, a pitcher that takes out everything. I mean, really, it's um, all. There's so many uh, pharmaceutical residues now in water. Besides all the heavy metals, PCBs, dioxin, and fluoride and chlorine, sediment, all this stuff. So just get a good filter <laughs> and filter that stuff out because you know we have a chemical industry. The petrochemical industry is is wedded with the pharmaceutical industry. It's the same industry. The pharmaceutical industry is a branch of a subset of the chemical industry, which is a subset of the petroleum industry. These industries thrive on chemicals. There's over 100,000 chemicals that they're creating that are toxic, that are spewed out into the water, land, earth everywhere, and they end up in our body and through the water, through the air, through the food, through everything. So we have to be aware of that and, and filter, right? Filter the water. Be aware of the food. Make sure your food is organic. It's really important. I, I can't stress that enough. Glyphosate is a broad spectrum antibiotic. It's a carcinogen. It's a, it causes birth defects. It's, it's just devastating to the microbiome of the soil and of our own bodies. You've got to buy organic. We don't go to restaurants anymore if they're not organic. We won't eat food if it's not organic. In the last couple of years, it's gotten much more serious, really. It's really serious. I mean, don't buy it if it's not organic and as much as possible, grow it yourself or buy from people, you know, that when they say it's organic, like the local farmer's market, talk to them as much as possible. Take responsibility for the quality of your food, of your water, of your health, of your consciousness. We have to take responsibility. When I tell people I haven't been to a doctor since 1972, you know, for, for some kind of health problem, um, they think, oh, you're, you know, you're bragging and you're, you're just, you know, something. I'm, it's not, it's just, look, if we take responsibility for our health on every level, we don't have to be dependent on the medical system. We have our own inner doctor. We have our own inner health guru. And we know how to live our lives in a way that's in harmony with the people around us and with nature and with ourselves. And we can be in harmony and, and resist the temptation to just go and have a chemical <laughs> because those chemicals are toxic. So water is important. There's so many levels to this. Try to know where your water comes from. Make sure it's filtered if possible. We also, all the water that comes here where we live onto our land goes through a structure, structuring device. There's a company um, called Natural Action Technology. Uh, and natural action technology works on the, uh, this, the guy, I forget his name, Schauberger, Schauberger from Austria, like back in the hundred years ago or 150 years ago, he noticed how water swirls in natural water courses through, through streams and, and in lakes, it's moving and it's alive. Water is alive. And when you run water through pipes for long distances, you're basically destroying the life. The, the molecules all get lined up in a rigid way and the water loses a lot of its vitality. And this is real. And we've discovered that. So you can buy a thing. It's not expensive. And you, you can buy one you can have on your counter. So you just, when you, we have a special drinking container that structures the water. The container itself structures the water. It's, 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 it's built on the golden mean. 
um, which is a natural, uh, the harmony in nature. But you can also um, pour the water when, you, when we pour it into that through a little structuring device. We also have the main pipe that comes into our house and the main pipe that feeds our garden for all of our irrigation. It's structured. And it's true, it, the, the plants need less water because when the water is not structured, it's, it's less bioavailable to our cells or to the cells of the plants. And so a lot of it is just goes through, it's just not usable. So I've noticed I don't need to drink as much water. Now that we structure the water, it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be, I don't need to drink as much. The water is just more easily assimilated. And uh, you know, we live, we're so far away from living naturally and that's the problem. So use this knowledge and use these appropriate technologies in a way that help you to be healthy, right? So structure the water, filter the water, and then get into water, jump into water, living water. We, we, we ended up finally buying a house after 17 years living on the road. When we lived on the road, it was great. We would camp in state parks and we would swim in the streams and in the beaches and the oceans and the lakes. You know, every day, you know, I, I just think that you can get into nature every day, get in, connect with water. Water is a great ally, a great friend, especially clean. We have a spring fed lake. We the, finally bought a house and we're like, I can, in my bicycle, I can be at the beach in 55 seconds. <laughs> I go every morning down to that lake, even when it's like, you know, 40 degrees, like it is today, I'll be in the water. I'll be the only one, but I'll be in the water. Uh, because the water, uh, cold water, whatever, it, you know, it's, it's our friend. It's a great healing power. Jump in and, and just dive into the water if you can, or take a, at least have a shower, take a cold rinse, cold water. Wim Hof, uh, I'll just mention his name, you know, check out his, his work, breathing and water. He's been able to completely transform his immune system and teach others to do the same thing. And he's rewriting the tech, medical textbooks. Medical textbooks say, well, bacteria cause disease. He says, no, they don't. Viruses cause disease. No, they don't. Not, not him. He doesn't get sick from anything, right? They try to make him sick. He doesn't, he doesn't get sick. You know, it's the same thing. It's the same thing with me. I know it. I mean, I, my fear of viruses and bacteria is zero. I mean, because when you have a healthy uh, system, the bacteria and viruses are your friends. They're, they're basically very benevolent. They're, the whole thing is benevolent. They're trying to help you all the time. We live in a medical system and a whole system, an agricultural system based on fear and violence and, and domination of nature. So we're afraid of everything. We're afraid of animals. We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of bacteria. We're afraid of viruses. We're alone. We're humans. We're very afraid of everything. That's because of animal agriculture and the violence and, and horror. We're in, we're in the clear cutting of force and the violence we're inflicting at boomerangs back. And so we're afraid of everything. We're not part of it anymore. You know, we have to forget that. We have to resist that dive into nature, jump into, I never was worried. I mean, we, we traveled all over India, China, every, people say, oh, you're going to get sick, or, you know, this and that. No, I mean, we, I never got sick. So the whole idea is uh, to embrace life <laughs> and realize that we can build a healthy immune system, but, but we should, but be aware of chemicals. The chemicals that's the problem. And the, the whole CDC, you know, they have two divisions uh, when they look into a, an outbreak of a disease. One is if it was a toxic chemical, the other is if was it a virus or bacteria. And, and they always want to say it was a virus because if it's a virus, then they can make more money, right? Because the CDC has been captured, obviously, by big pharma. So they can make more money saying, oh, we had a viral outbreak. So like in, in South America, when they spray all this toxic chemicals and cause these horrible birth defects and microencephalopathy to people. Uh, they didn't want to say, well, it was because of a toxic chemical, then they could get sued. So they said, oh, it was a Zika virus. It was a virus that caused the problem. Oh, now we need to vaccinate everybody and then everything will be, will be, will be better, right? I mean, you got to understand, you know, you're being lied to constantly. So take responsibility for our health and for the quality of the air and the water and the food and the thoughts and the life and the relationships that we're having, that's the key to health. So there's a lot to say about water, but basically that, just, just get into water that's clean and healthy, take a swim, 
uh, drink water that's clean, structure the water, purify. Okay, air. Let's talk about air. Uh, the same thing. I mean, we live in a county. That's one of the reasons we moved here to Lake County. has the cleanest air in the whole United States. Um, try to do deep breathing. I mean, I don't have time. Breath, the key to being healthy in many ways is breathing. We don't, we don't, we're not taught how to breathe properly in our society at all. Most people are breathing in their chest, shallow breaths, maybe 10 or 12 breaths per minute. I mean, a, a way of living in a healthy way is we're breathing three or four, maybe five times a minute in our, down here in our belly. We can learn that, practice, be conscious of your breathing. Every take, I take a breath about every 10 seconds, right? Uh, or maybe 20 seconds. I mean, you know, an inhale, inhale 10 seconds or inhale five seconds even. I mean, at least five seconds. Like, I mean, if we're, if we're breathing, inhaling every, and exhaling five seconds, that's six breaths per minute. That's, that's, you shouldn't be breathing faster than that, really. I mean, breathe, give yourself at least a five second inhalation and exhalation and be conscious and let it come all the way into your belly and just savor it, right? I mean, savor the, the wonders of breathing. Release, just breathe, just exhale and go, ah, <laughs> and take time to yawn and, and sigh in the sense. I mean, sighing is just a big breath. Every once in a while, our body will naturally take a nice ah, big breath and just release. You know, look, our body's basically a magnificent system to purify itself. That's what it does. And there's five main ways that we release toxins, Okay. One is through the bowel, one is through the bladder, one is through the skin, one is through the sinuses, and one is through the lungs, through the breath. 80% of all toxins come out of the lungs. So our body's always trying to purify. If we don't breathe properly, especially if we wear a face diaper, you know, we're breathing our own exhaust. We're getting sick. Don't do it. Never do it. God gave you a mouth and a nose to breathe, right? So breathe and breathe and enjoy breathing. Nobody's going to stop that, right? Don't allow it. Don't comply with anything that's going to stop your breathing. That's you know, The word br breath is spirit. The Latin word spirit means breath. They're trying to block your, our spirit. Block it. No, so no, no, no. So learn to breathe. And that's your, that's your divine connection with that. Believe me. I mean, I've meditated thousands of hours and breath is the key to the mind. If you want to quiet the mind, quiet the breathing. If you want to have a joyful mind, have a joyful breathing and conscious breathing and just being aware of the breath throughout the day, we can become aware and we can breathe deeply and enjoy that. I can't say enough about breathing. Another thing though I want to say is about, about air and breath is about the environments that we're living in, the, the heating and air conditioning. I mean, I, I can't, I, quite honestly, I, I can't be in most buildings anymore I, because they're, the air is so toxic. There's so much indoor air pollution and you know, so many chemicals and carpets and air fresheners and the heating, this forced air heating, it, it's so terrible. I mean, no wonder people are sick all the time. They're breathing in this forced air and, and then the air conditioning, which strips all the negative ions out of the air. It, it's really terrible. I mean, the air, the quality of air in most buildings is hideous. It makes people sick. And that's where the money is. You want sick people if, you, if you're the pharmaceutical, medical, governmental complex, right? There's no incentive to go back to the old water, you know, warming up the water, and then the, the heat just kind of radiates naturally. Uh, so we we ended up living in an RV where we never had to be in a heated building or an air conditioned building, or minimized it. Uh, and now we ended up buying a house here in Northern California where the climate is relatively mild. And we so we never we don't use we've never used the air conditioner. We've never used the heater <laughs> in our house. <laughs> we we just don't use it. And there's two keys to that. One is 
um, to to um, learn to um, work with nature, right? So, you know, in the morning we open the doors and bring the cool air in in the summer and then we close them up. I mean, we, we figure it out. Uh, and then be willing to wear warm, you know, more layers. Like, you know, we in the, in the winter here, I, I'm wearing three or four layers. And in the summer, I'm wearing less, you know, and we get outside and we, and we take showers. We have an outside shower. We have a shower. That's another thing. We've, we have a, we have shower, we have bathrooms and, you know, we have two bathrooms and we have showers. We've never used them in 10 years. We've never used our shower in 10 years. <laughs> we uh, either go to the lake and take a swim or we have an outside shower. We always shower outside. We made an outside shower and we shower outside. And even when we come back and it's 40 degrees and it's freezing, we take an outside shower. It's unheated. It's cold. It's great. In the, in the start in the moonlight right um, so the body does not want to always be comfortable that's the point we live in a toxic comfort zone we want to be in our comfort zone and the more we do that we know people that have a thermostat right in in there and the temperature is always between <laughs> between 70 and 76 or whatever i mean that's not healthy our bodies thrive on change you know when it gets colder then breathe into it right and we can we can my core is warm when it gets really hot we breathe into it. we learn we can learn to become more flexible our body becomes stronger um, by being challenged it's good to challenge it's good to challenge the body the body um we're the we're we are not um the servant of the body the body's a servant of us we're eternal infinite consciousness that was never born and will never die we're incorporeal spiritual beings we, we're just manifesting through a vehicle. I'm not going to let that vehicle tell me what to do. So we jump into cold water. It's, uh, we, we enjoy, we don't use a lot of energy. We have all our energy comes from the sun, right? We have, we, so, so uh, yeah. So we run, sometimes we'll run a little space heater. It's solar powered, it's run by, the, by our solar panels. So uh, everything's run from solar panels. We, um, we feed all of our energy back into the grid. So we're supplying actually the local neighbors with their power too. So try to minimize and decentralize your, your footprint, right? So that you're growing your own food, making your own energy, you have access to your own water, uh, purify the water. Don't rely on as much as possible on artificial heating and air conditioning. Just figure it out somehow. I mean, as best you can, um, something that's healthy because forced air heating and air conditioning really are not healthy. And, but, you know, if you have to do your best you can, but connect, to, you know, find ways to, to, to live more naturally, have fresh air, you know, open the doors and windows. I mean, we, we, Madeline is an absolute fanatic <laughs> for fresh air. It's freezing out and she's opening the doors. And when I was like, well, okay, go ahead, open it up, <laughs> you know, and fresh air is great, you know, so just understanding that and, and then sunshine. This is another thing we've been told to stay out of the sun. I have, I get into the sun every day uh, and it's good to do full body if you can, you know, like we have a deck that's private, right? We don't have to wear clothes if we don't want, we never do when we're out there. And, and so um, get in the, the body loves the sun. It's true that sun can cause skin cancer, but that's only if you're eating trans fats and saturated fats, the saturated fats create the problem. They make so when the when the sun hits our skin, it causes free radicals and we get skin cancer. If you're eating a healthy organic diet with no trans fats, without processed oils, the sun is your friend. Getting the sun is information. It's healing power. Uh, I don't ever wear sun. I haven't worn sunscreen in like forty years, and I get in the sun for hours and hours at a time. Uh, my skin has learned to love the sun. You know, I so. You know, I don't completely overdo. I'm not telling you to, you know, go out and get a sunburn. You know, be conscious, be aware, put on some cloth. But you, you can learn to tolerate a lot of sun and and figure it out, right? Just trust it. I never wear sunglasses. I, you know, maybe a few times in the winter if it's if I'm cross country skiing or something or super bright. But I never wear sunglasses. <laughs> I mean, eyes. That's a whole other thing I want to talk about. Eyes and and teeth. You know, there's so much, there's so much to learn. There's so much. I can see that I'm running out of time. Um, that's that's uh, air. Breathe. Uh, healthy, uh, fresh air. 
and uh, have an air purifier, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you have smoke or something, you know, buy a good, buy a HEPA filter and, and have health, have good air. I mean, filters are important. If you have indoor air pollution is a big problem. Getting plenty of sun, right? Sun is, is, is the fire element, earth, air, fire. I mean, earth, water, earth is um, basically gardening, earthing, not wearing shoes, if you can, so connect, reconnecting with the earth, gardening. I can't say enough about gardening. We, we've created this food forest, go out and nurture plants and give them compost tea and, and harvest and, you know, just the whole thing. I mean, um, that is a beautiful connection. We create an ecosystem. We've created an ecosystem here where birds and bees and insects are at home. They're happy. Uh, unlike our neighbors, lawns are, are toxic. You know, we have 40 million acres of lawns in the United States that's the most heavily sprayed with toxic chemicals more than any crop is these lawns. And it's, it, they're toxic chem, uh, crops. And if we could convert even uh, a third of that into food forests, we could feed everyone and we could feed everyone on in the United States, for example, if people would just, if just one third of the people would convert their lawns to a food forest. So we have, we did that, right? We have, we, this, we have this small piece of land. We don't have a lot of land about a quarter of an acre. Uh, we have a half an acre, but half of the acres down a ravine, we can't even get, can't use it really. But the quarter of an acre that we have, um, we've planted 70 fruit and nut trees over the years. They give us a lot of wonderful, it's like we give to them, they give back fruits and nuts, all kinds. I mean, I, I could a list of, you know, apples and pears and peaches and plums and apricots and nectarines and figs and persimmons and pomegranates and olives and all kinds of citrus, oranges and this and that. I mean, a lot and berries, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries and all kinds of greens and vegetables and herbs, all kinds of herbs. Madeline, we really grow food and build the soil. And every year we put, we put um, com, uh, um, uh, weird chips down. That we've been doing that now for 10 years. It's a 10 year old, it's still a young food forest. And the trees are still kind of getting up there, but they're getting to the point now where they're starting to give quite a bit of fruit. So it's an investment, you know, you really invest. It takes years and years, but it gets better every year. And we can build the soil. We can build the local insect communities. We can build the microbiome, and the mushrooms and the mycelium under the earth and create a healthy ecosystem. And everybody can do that, right? We can think globally and act locally and do that and take time to, to create a healthy food, a space of love, a space of healing. And when we, and this is something really important. When we give love to plants and they get to know us, then they will give that love back to us. So the more we give to these plants, the more, and, and we, all of our, amp, we call it amber, right? All of our amber, all of our urine. I mean, we don't waste that. That's, that's nitrogen. In fact, of, of human manure, human waste, right? We have feces and urine. Um, about 70% or 75% of the, of the value uh, of nutrition is in the urine because that's where the nitrogen is. So it's relatively simple. Like in Sweden, they do that. In Sweden, uh, they have a, a apartment complexes and they have dividing toilets. So when you poop, it goes one place. When you pee, it goes in another place. It goes and they separate it. And it goes into these big tanks, the bottom of the apartment buildings. And then, the, and then the farmers collect that and they mix it with water and they spray it on the fields. And it's the best fertilizer you can imagine. I mean, it's, the, it's called liquid gold. So don't waste it, right? I mean, mix it with water and put it on your plants. Um, that's what we do. And we've been doing it for years. It's fantastic. I mean, our plants are thriving because they're getting not only the nitrogen, that's the material scientific delusional. I mean, it's important but they're getting the information. They're getting our, us, they get, they're getting our energy, they're getting our love, they're getting our urine, they're getting the information of who we are as unique, two unique human beings. And plants are designed to tune into that and create healing foods. When we grow our own food, we're growing really medicines. We're growing healing foods. They, the plants, plants love humans. They, they, love, they love us. They want, they want us to be healthy. 
And you can, we can tune into this. I mean, we can learn this. And, and, and so when we give them love, we we're receiving that love. Uh, and I, I met this guy in uh, Maui, uh, Swaru. He planted a breadfruit tree. And he said, if you look at my body, at least half of this body is that breadfruit tree right there. The more I give love to that tree, the more, the bigger it grew. He planted the tree. And, and now it's this gigantic tree. And most trees only give breadfruit for maybe uh, four or five months. His, his gives fruit like 10 months of the year. <laughs> he's, he's eating it. You know, it's this starchy fruit that you can steam or bake or fry or whatever. And so he's, uh, he's, he says, it's like, that's how it, that's, he's right. The more you love these plants, the more they love us back. And they just, we can live on love. We can live on the divine provenance of plants of fruits and nuts and seeds and grains and vegetables that are given by the earth and uh, we can build up the soil we can build up their lives so connecting with the earth gardening and creating a food forest do it i mean find a way wherever you live even if it's just some pots on the on the balcony or on the porch or on the by the back step or something you can do something or, or, or find a community garden where you can rent some space, something. But I think connecting with the earth is really important. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, like having a morning program. Just make sure that your consciousness is aligned with your daily life, that you're waking up in the morning with, and, and cultivating a sense of gratitude. See, our body is our servant. And if I'm, if I'm telling my body, if I say in the morning, oh, it's Monday, oh, I don't want to go to work today. What am I doing? I'm telling every cell in my body, well, this guy doesn't want to work. He doesn't want to do anything. He, you know, why, why should I do anything? <laughs> the stomach, the kidneys, the liver, they're like, you know, if I wake up in the morning and go, wow, another day, uh, I can't wait to see what wonderful things uh, are possible. Then every cell in our being is like, great, okay, we gotta, we're, we're here to help this person, you know, we're here to serve. Our, our body is here to serve us. The cells and organs in our system are all working together in, in, in cooperation and with a microbiome, a community of bacteria that live inside of us also to digest our food. So the more we're connected with the joy of fulfilling a purpose, uh, of bringing beauty and creativity and the unique being that we are to the world and to share that with others, the more our body is going to be happy, right? Why would I go to a drugstore and get some chemical that's going to suppress and harm? <laughs> Why would I buy it? I haven't had an antibiotic in ever. I'm, well, I did. I guess when I was a kid, I didn't know better. Um, but, uh, you know, since I, since I went to college, 1972, right? It was the last time I actually... I went to the infirmary because I had a, a boil on my lip and she gave me some kind of antibiotic. That was the last, that's it. It's 1972. <laughs> last time I took any kind of drug or aspirin, Tylenol, X-Lax, Right Guard, all in Viagra, all these things in the drugstore, all these things. If we take responsibility uh, for our life and cultivate a sense of gratitude and the sense that what we are is a spiritual being. And so we, with our consciousness, are actually learning from our body and creating the, the environment, the mental environment, which creates the cells. We can transform them through our mind. And so that's why meditation is, I think, so important, because we can quiet our mind and dwell in inner silence. Inner silence. You know, it's, we're only here for a few short decades. It goes by so fast. I mean, I remember like yesterday, I was only 22 and I was learning uh, from, from the, this, I was taking a, cl a class in Chinese language. And she said, if you ever go to China, um, you can't, if you try to tell anybody anything and you're not, you're not at least 60 years old, they'll think you're, you're ridiculous. You don't know anything until you're 60. Right. And I remember thinking, wow, I'll never be 60. That's, that's so far away. <laughs> And now it's so great when I was in China, I could say, well, now you got to listen to me because I am 60 years old. <laughs> you know, where did those decades go? They fly by. So, but we are eternal consciousness. We're dwelling always actually in the silence of the infinity of eternal awareness. And from that space of love and completeness and radiant beingness, which is beyond disease or health, it's just being, we, we create 
our life. From that space, we create everything. We create, we manifest our world. We are the creators. We are never, ever, ever, ever a victim. We're creating whatever, whatever happens, it's for our own good. It's for our own learning. And it may seem like we didn't like it at the time, but there's always a gift there. And I found this. I told the story last night, I guess Tuesday, of how I always have this back pain. And then I realized it was this little boy that I that I hadn't actually made my peace with. And he was complaining and he was afraid. And I realized I don't have to be afraid. And the back pain went away. These are the kind of things that happen. I had glasses. I mean, my my vision was so bad, I couldn't even read the numbers when I was in college. Um, I had thick glasses. I was so nearsighted. And then I had contact lenses. So I had them on all the time. You know, it started when I was about eight years old. I got a little blur and then it, it kept getting worse and worse. And I kept getting stronger and stronger glasses until I finally I could hardly see. And I had, so I, you know, it was a big problem. I, and, and then when I went on that walk with my brother, um, I took the glasses off. I was just living in a total blur, right? I couldn't, I could hardly, I just couldn't see <laughs> very, very far, but I just, you know, I, I developed my intuition. I, you know, I just learned to trust and follow and figure it out. And, but my, I, I just worked hard on my vision. I, for, for years, for decades, I learned practices. I learned the mind, mind, body connection, nutrition, breathing, healthy visual habits. I did all kinds of practices, looking with one eye, the other eye, double, you know, learning how to how to take my fingers like this and then double them farther and farther apart. You, know, you can make prefocal doubles, postfocal doubles. I did so many exercises with, with my eyes and, and I, and I, I, I would wear a thing like this um, that would divide the page in half. So half the page was my left eye, half the page was my right eye. I learned to get my eyes uh, that they were, you know, so they were working independently. I, I had to do all this stuff. And, but just by learning to breathe, by learning uh, proper vision techniques, sketching, like learning instead of, see, when we get, when we have a blur, it's because we lock the neck muscles and we just fixate and we just kind of start staring at the world and we, we're kind of afraid of the world and we're staring. And so the, the eyes start to harden, the muscles around the eyes start to harden and a blur develops. And so the whole idea is psychologically, to make friends with the world. That's a big part of it, to want to see the world again, right? And then to, to relax those muscles subconsciously. It's an it's a, it's a, a unconscious um, contraction that is, it becomes like a cramp and, and they just perm And then wearing glasses or contacts that just sets it in stone. And the eyes, if they try to heal, they can't. <clears throat> so by taking the glasses off, that was, a, that was it. I mean, I was a customer for life for the optometrist. <clears throat> I would be giving thousands and thousands of dollars the rest of my life, going for eye exams, getting contact lenses, getting glasses. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be the slave of that medical industry. So um, I think I'm running out. Am I running out of time? Six to eight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so I, I stopped wearing. And so my eye started healing. And that's the good news. And so I, I passed my driver's test. My eye vision went from 2,400 to 2,200 to 2,100 to 2,050 to 2,040. When you get to 2,040, you can pass the test. So I passed the test. My vision just got better. And I've passed the test every year, every time since. So, um, so you know, we can heal our vision with our consciousness and with proper uh, visual techniques, learning how to use our eyes properly, relaxing our neck, yawning. Oh, everybody yawn. Oh, stretch. Oh, open. Mm, it feels so good. Yay. Make a nice audible yawn. Stretch. You know, don't we, we make ourselves into machines. We're afraid of our impression we're making on other people. Forget all that. You know, just let the the let, let ourselves yawn. Let ourselves uh, breathe. Let our eyes move let your eyes move you know your whole let your whole your neck uh, unlock the neck so you so imagine from the tip of your nose there's a pencil and you're just sketching everything all the time so your eyes are, are moving naturally blink blinking people stop blinking blink and and uh, breathe and 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 uh, this is really the key to healthy vision same thing with people have trouble with their teeth that's another thing you know i've 
get the mercury out of your mouth, first of all, and do it well. I had a lot of mercury. I had a lot of fillings. I ate a standard American diet as a kid. So I had a lot of fillings. So I get the mercury out of my mouth. Then don't use dental. Don't use toothpaste, right? I mean, don't do anything. Don't get any, don't do anything they tell you to do. <laughs> I mean, that's good to brush your teeth. What we do now is we use uh, like a, uh, like a, like a, um, an irrigator water, you know, squirting it through after every meal and maybe some floss to clean between the teeth. And I brush now and then usually every evening um, with a rotodent, which is a, a gentle um, like uh, spins around. And I use a, a mixture that I make myself of baking soda and salt with peppermint oil. Uh, you can buy from Aura MD and make, you can make your own. You do not want to use uh, toothpaste, right? They have fluoride, which is toxic. They have sodium lauryl sulfate as a foaming agent, which makes you have gums problems, makes your gums recede, makes billions of dollars for the dental industry. All these toothpaste causes gum disease. Everybody's got problems with their teeth. Um, I love it. I have great teeth. You know, I mean, having great teeth is, is great. You know, you can, I can bite and chew and everything. So, but it, you know, it means being, you know, conscious and working. Don't use toxic chemicals. Uh, we have to really guard against the toxic chemicals. And, and then in the, in our lotion, people put all kinds of lotion on their skin. And I mean, be really careful. I don't use any lotions. I don't use any creams. I don't use anything. Madeline does, but she, oh my gosh, I lost, I ran out of time. She uses um, really organic, really careful. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I, there's so much, there's so many things we have to be aware of, but the main thing is to, to learn to connect with your intuition and don't believe anything. <laughs> I was raised in the newspaper family. I learned don't trust the media. It's all the advertisers are determining the news. And the advertisers are the big fast food companies, the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the banks and lurking in the background. They don't make money from healthy people. Take responsibility for your health. I think I have to stop. Ben, how are we doing? Am I, am I right that I'm over? Uh, you know, I, I wanted to have not over questions, your, but. Um, you're, you're just right, Will. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we won't have questions this time, but that's okay. Honestly, everything you've shared here is just so incredibly valuable for all of us. Um, so yeah, it's okay. We didn't have questions. What we need to do next time is book you for a six hour slot because <laughs> want, I don't know where the time goes. It's a time war. We, we want more. <laughs> right. And it was just so wonderful. Everything that you shared today and, you know, personally, you know, having heard some of this before from you um, to see the photos that you shared today was so meaningful to like really bring it to life. And uh, for some of us uh, and for all of us, really. So just want to thank you for that. And, 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 Sharing that piece of, of your experience is phenomenal. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so my gosh, I, I, I just, I feel uh, lighter. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, Ben. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Go forth and multiply the message. I, I wish I had more time, but check out our videos, our YouTube channel. There's a lot of videos there about our food forests. Get a home shield. There's a place called Fresh and Alive that, that'll protect you from EMF radiation, your whole house. You know, there's so many things to be aware of, but um, just, uh, just question the official stories and keep watching the Real Truth About Health Conference for this wonderful information. I'm so glad to be part of it. Thank you. We're, we're so glad you're here. And before we let you go, um, remind everybody, where's the best place to get World Peace Diet? Yeah, worldpeacediet.com. That's our website or willtuttle.com. Uh, you can always just go there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and we have uh, other channels. We have Telegram channels. We have stuff on Amazon, whatever. But yeah, that, those are our main websites. Um, that's wonderful. And are those the best places to get some of your CDs and things as well? Yeah, yeah, you can get our CDs there. I, the CDs, the music, oh, and meditations, guided meditations, the, you know, like the Four Baharas meditation, which we do, love, compassion, joy, and peace, to really send that out. And, uh, iTunes, um, Spotify, Google Play, you know, all the all the Audible, all those uh, audio, all those kind of um, avenues, you can get everything there, as well as our website. Our website has everything too. Yeah, amazing. Um... You know, it turns out, I, I think I probably have a couple of minutes. If, if there's anything else you, you want to share that you didn't quite get to yet, we'd love to hear it. Oh, really? 
Yeah. Well, great. Well, um, I, I can just say, uh, I mentioned just in brief, briefly there, the home shield. That's another thing that I think, uh, I think some people are, are talking about EMF radiation, but that's another thing to be conscious of. And there's some, again, great products that are out to protect us from the EMF radiation. So incorporate these things, right? Like the home shield from Fresh and Alive, which creates, that's like an, an, our entire house and our whole yard, our garden and everything is protected. It also tends to dissipate chemtrails. Chemtrails are a big problem, I think. Um, the, the geoengineering toxic stuff. So dissipate those uh, and, 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 uh, and have a, a healthier uh, environment that way. Uh, it's good to, to look into these things. And uh, like in our, in our van, Madeline, just the, the, yesterday, actually, she, she got this special cloth um, in, the, in the curtains of, the, of our micro van that we travel in um, that blocks EMF radiation. You know, so like at night when we're uh, sleeping, um, it blocks the radiation. So make sure, you know, you're just aware of that. No, like don't hold your <laughs> cell phone up to your head, right? Uh, we, we have, you know, have one with a, like this with a tube. Um, if you're using, um, uh, if you're listening to your, on your uh, iPhone or uh, that kind of thing. So just be aware, I guess, that there are multiple attempts um, to sort of dumb us down, to reduce our health, to reduce the solidarity that we feel with each other uh, and with nature and to do the best we can to refuse to comply with those things, right? That's what veganism is at its core. It's saying, I'm not gonna comply with violence against animals. You know, they, they want us to eat burgers and, and, and fish sticks and cheese. And I'm, no, I'm not gonna comply with that. And, and so it's saying no, but the no is based on a big yes. The underlying yes is I'm saying yes to kindness and compassion and caring and health and connection with nature and with other human beings, and then cultivate healthy relationships with other people, being loving and saying loving things. I mean, this, this is a critical part. Most people are sick because of their toxic relationships that they're in. They're, they're, either, they're either still angry with their parents or they've internalized some kind of emotional thing or they're frustrated with their job. So it's up to us to take responsibility as best we can for the quality of our relationships with other people and with nature and with our food and with air and the water and the sun, you know, the five elements and with the, the source of our life make a healthy relationship with the source of what we are because we that is we're all going to get to that point guaranteed when we leave this body and at that point what's going to matter is how we lived our life how we responded to what's happening we can't change the outer world right now our whole world is going through a major changes crisis kind of situation so how do we respond to that that's the thing and we can respond in a way that's positive we can respond in a way that brings love and harmony, but it's only our inner wisdom that can tell it what is our unique way of responding. I can't tell someone else how they should do, but I can share some things that I've learned, right? I've learned to question everything. Like we don't, we don't teach, we don't teach people how to go to the bathroom, right? Right. I mean, it was so great going to Korea and back in, in the, like when, 40 years ago, 1980, early 1980s, there were no toilets, right? There were no, like these thrones. We, we sit up on this thing with our legs, legs dangling down. I mean, that's no way to make it, have a bowel movement. You can't, you, the body can't even hardly do it, right? It's, it, it's, it's a recipe for chronic constipation in the entire population. <laughs> Nobody is squatting. You're supposed to be squatting, right? You're supposed to be squatting. I mean, that's what we did for millions of years. When I was in Korea, you know, you squatted over a a hole <laughs> in the floor or in the, in the outhouse. And so the, so you just eliminate easily. Right. Yeah. So you do something about it. Right. I mean, I, I haven't sat on a throne. I don't do it. You know, I figure out something else. <laughs> I mean, we have to, we have to really, we live in a society that's organized around making us unhealthy sitting in a chair. I haven't sat, I don't, we don't have any chairs in our entire house. Everything is cushions on the floor. I'm sitting on the floor right now. Wow. Um, you know, I'm getting up and sitting down, getting up, sitting down, I'm moving. Uh, and my back is, is got a natural arch to it. I have, you know, I have Zafus and Zabutan. So these are cushions from Asia. You know, we're, we're designed to be on the earth. Why are, we, why are we always separating ourselves from the earth and sitting in these chairs like we're the kings and queens? 
getting like the diseases of kings and queens, like getting sore backs, getting all clogged up. You know, we're, we're, our bodies are meant to move, to get up and get down, to be close to the earth, and um, and to, and just question all of the everything we've inherited. Pretty much is not working in our interest. We need to recreate the way we live. You know, just. Uh, that's, that's, question everything. So I probably have to stop here. <laughs> it's just so perfectly said. And, and yeah, it is time for us to get on to our next lecture, but so perfectly said. And for anybody that thinks the world peace diet is just about food, uh, I think this tells you otherwise. Uh, you know, there's just so much more to what Will Tuttle has to share. And um, we're so, so appreciative, Will. Uh, again, you come back year after year and sharing this is invaluable and so meaningful. So uh, you know that I'm not the only person that wants to thank you, though. So we're going to have our tech team unmute our entire audience. Um, what does everybody want to say to Will Tuttle for all of this? Thank you. 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 Thank you.